Hello and welcome to Inside the Americas. I'm Delon D'Souza. Coming up on the show this week. Colombia elects its first left-wing president, Gustavo Petro, due to be sworn in to the top job in August alongside Francia Marquez, the country's first black female vice president. Criminal groups in Mexico look to extort profits from avocado producers. This is the producers themselves struggle with the effects of climate change. And the United States becomes the first country in the world to offer the COVID-19 inoculation to infants as young as six months. But first, Colombians have voted for a new president. 62-year-old Gustavo Petro set to become the first leftist in the country's top job. The former rebel of the now-defunct M19 movement beat millionaire businessman Rodolfo Hernandez in Sunday's election. Petro will be sworn in as president in August, replacing the deeply unpopular Ivan Duque. For more on this story, we can cross to Medellin, Colombia, and speak to Gerard Martin, a political sociologist. Thank you very much for joining us here on France 24 today. Now, Gustavo Petro failed twice to win the presidency. What changed? Um, the country changed. The uh, atmosphere in the country changed. Um, the impact of the pandemic has been enormous in terms of poverty, especially in the regions where there were already a lot of problems. And um, as you said, as you mentioned, uh, the, the current president, President Duque, is uh, very unpopular, uh, considered not to have been able to forcefully implement also the commitments of the peace accord signed with the form of Fargarilla. And so there has been a lot of demands and a lot of expectation towards a stronger national government that would also reach deep into the regions and overcome many of the social problems people confront. Why has the left been stigmatized in the country up, up, up until now? Well, there's two lefts in Colombia, I would say, historically. There is an armed left, the guerrilla uh, left, let's say, and there is a non-armed left that has been kind of, um, you know, out of the picture to a certain extent, but has always existed. Um, what we see now is a coming together of these former armed uh, left and uh, broad areas of the of the non-armed left um, and that is also a new situation right part of the um, Pedro alliance are also the uh, former uh, FARC combatants Pedro is not from the FARC right Pedro disarmed de demobilized his guerrilla group the M19 gave up arms 30 years ago mm. and since then Pedro himself has committed to democracy. He has been the mayor of Bogota, he has been city council member, he has been senator. And so um, um, the left continued to be stigmatized um, because it is uh, by certain sectors in the Colombian uh, society, it continues to be um, you know, painted as if related to the armed, uh, armed uh, ways of uh, power. He wants to reform the country's health system, the pension system, amongst other things. Can he deliver, given that Congress is fractured and, and he has stiff opposition from very powerful forces? He is surrounded by some very uh, respected and also experienced uh, former senators who, who are more uh, from the um, middle field of the politics may be able to move things easier in Congress than he would be able to do himself. And, and the big challenge for Pedro and his team is going to be to prioritize. He's not going to be able to do everything he promised, but if he would prioritize you know, some of the things, most important things that people have asked for, and one of them would be the implementation of the peace accord, especially in those regions that are still impacted by insecurity, by narco trafficking, uh, bringing more services, more institutions to those regions would be one great thing. Another thing would effectively, you know, deliver some of the uh, social agenda issues. And a third thing would be hopefully to be able to get the ELN to the negotiation table. Jared Martin, thank you very much for, uh, for your analysis today. With pleasure. Now, as uh, Jared Martin touched upon, in August, another first will be taking place in Colombia. The country will be swearing in its first female black vice president. Francia Marquez has emerged as a powerful voice for marginalized communities and has vowed to tackle inequalities when she arrives in office. Yinka Uyatade reports. In Colombia's presidential election, history was made twice. The country not only elected its first ever leftist president, Gustavo Petro, but with him, it also chose its first ever black vice president, Petro's running mate, Francia Marquez. 
After 214 years, we have achieved a government of the people, the government of the ordinary people, the government of the nobodies of Colombia. The 40-year-old knows exactly what it's like to come from the margins of society. Hailing from the region of Cauca, Marquez grew up in a poor family and had her first child at the age of 16. While studying for a law degree, she worked her way through university cleaning houses. Marquez's environmental activism started early. In her teens, she campaigned against the construction of a dam which threatened to upend her community in Cauca. Since then, her activism has earned her accolades. She won the Goldman Environmental Prize, the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for the Environment in 2018. Back where it all started in her hometown of Cauca, residents held her election victory. She didn't let herself be defeated by any obstacle. Because of that, we will all move forward and live a happy life. Marquez's humble beginnings may be a far cry from those who traditionally go into politics in Colombia, but the activist has become a national phenomenon. Her campaign spoke to those frustrated with the political establishment. The self-professed feminist didn't shy away from topics like women's rights, inequality and race. She's become a powerful voice for Afro-Colombians who make up around 10% of the country's population. Having black women and men challenging to occupy positions of power in this country is an act of racial justice. It's an act of justice for our Afro-descendant people. We have historically not only experienced structural racism and exclusion, but also the disproportionate effects of the armed conflict. Marquez's swift rise has not been easy. Throughout her campaign, she received death threats and racist insults. In office, she will lead a new equality ministry, mandated with improving women's rights and tackling challenges faced by low-income communities. Now, the Mexican state of Michoacán is the world's largest producer of avocados. Each year, the country produces 1.8 million tons of the fruit. Avocados are the sixth most consumed fruit in the world, and criminal groups in Mexico want a share in the profits and have been extorting producers while the effects of climate change threatens production itself. France 24's team on the ground reports. Jose Luis Mata keeps a close watch on his ripening avocados. These will be ripe in two months. They will be ready to cut. This year, avocado prices are soaring, sometimes reaching five euros per kilo in Mexican or American supermarkets. Like the majority of growers, Jose Luis Mata exports most of his crop to the United States. The top quality produce is for export, and what remains is for the national market. But back in February, the avocado industry had a bruising week. Whilst visiting a farm in Michoacán, a U.S. agricultural inspector received threatening phone calls. As a consequence, the U.S. suspended importation of all Mexican avocados for a week. Lurking at the roots of this lucrative industry, organized crime. Cartels want to reap their cut from the country's green gold at a time when exports are worth some $3.2 billion a year. Off camera, farmers tell us extortion is widespread. It's no longer a secret. Organized crime in economic terms is a cartel. They're the ones who determine prices through their influence during the harvesting, production, distribution and sale of the product. It's a very attractive market, unlike the drug market, which requires supplies from abroad or running laboratories. A race for profits that draws heavily on natural resources. It takes a thousand litres of water to produce one kilo of avocados. At the moment, we have water shortages. It's more complicated because there is more demand. There is one well for the whole area, including many farmers. Avocado farming can't keep going at this rate. This professor from the University of Morelia warns of disastrous consequences for the environment. There are serious repercussions in biodiversity loss, 
water pollution, water depletion, deforestation and fires. It's very likely that the environmental damage that is documented is the tip of the iceberg and that we have much greater environmental damage in reality. Over the past 30 years, agricultural activities and mainly avocado production have destroyed some 40% of Michoacan's forests. Now, children under the age of five in the United States can now receive a COVID-19 vaccination. The U.S. has become the first country in the world to offer the inoculation to infants as young as six months. The Biden administration says it expects the pace of shots to be slower than it was for teenagers and adults. Bringing Spider-Man along for an extra dose of bravery. Good job. Good job. Texan twins Jihan and Kian are three years old. They're among the first small children to be jabbed against COVID-19 in the U.S. One of them has very vulnerable health. He's had three open heart surgeries uh, the first five months and being, being immunocompromised. We're um, super thrilled. <laughs> We've been waiting for this for a long time. Uh, he's super high risk, so you know, it's, we've been living in a little bubble, can't do, you know, live normal toddler life, can't do the things that we want to do, and people don't all understand why, but now we, he has a little armor and that helps a lot. Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are now recommended by U.S. health authorities for babies and toddlers. Until now, the U.S. had only been vaccinating children over five years old. This is a very historic milestone. A monumental step forward, the United States is now the first country in the world to offer safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines for children as young as six months old. And the first time in our fight against this pandemic, nearly every American can now have access to life-saving vaccines. The European Medicines Agency could soon follow the American example and offer the Moderna vaccine to under six-year-olds. Other countries like Argentina, Chile and China have also vaccinated young children, though not with AR and messenger vaccines, considered to be the leading technology in this field. That's it. That's it. It's over. Over. That's it for this edition of Inside the Americas. From all of us on the team, thank you very much for watching.